before I get started, uh, Paul mentioned I used to work with Tetra Tech, so this work couldn't have been possible uh, without uh, collaboration with my ex colleagues. Yes, we broke up, but we've been amicable times. So <laughs> uh, and Michelle Schmidt. Um, so, um, by now you know that Edwards Aquifer Authority has a lot of tools at their disposal uh, to look at free charted slice and dice you know, in multiple ways. So, we're going to take uh, a not too deep dive into uh, a mechanistic platform, as Paul mentioned, the hydrological simulation program for Trent. But before we go into the modeling itself, I'd like to start with this uh, overarching history of uh, watershed modeling, because I don't know who I'm talking to in the crowd and what's the level of experience. So this is a neat graphic. I stole this from a book, and this is a book chapter written by uh, uh, Tony Denijin, I believe um, Gordon went to school with him, or went to the same school, uh, but uh, he's one of the forefathers. I for a job at Anderson Nichols. <laughs> <laughs> I did not have a job. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, you know, it shows you know the history of uh, watershed model uh, development uh, since the 1960s, and it's a neat graphic because it shows you know how the regulations and computer technology uh, and uh, you know, uh, how this whole technology came to being what it is uh, today. So a lot of the impetus for the uh, development of the watershed modeling tools uh, generally stem uh, from, from water quality issues. But the good thing is uh, you cannot do good water quality if your hydrology is not good. So, um, you know, it all starts with hydrology. So all these water quality models that are used in uh, watershed based planning, uh, TMDLs, etc. A big component of those models is hydrology. So uh, not just events, but long-term continuous simulation. So they're looking at multiple aspects of the water cycle and trying to use zeros and ones, basically. It's, it all boils down to zeros and ones because you're using computers to reasonably represent that uh, cycle. So nonetheless, um, you know, uh, the development of the uh, watershed modeling platforms one of the platforms that um, came out was the Hydrological Simulation Program, Fortran. So uh, what we are using is HSPF 14, I believe, which is the most recent version uh, of the HSPF uh, model. So again, you know, uh, Clean Water Act, et cetera, et cetera. So um, like I alluded to, you know, what we are trying to do is uh, take this complicated system that's on the left, uh, that's the USGS representation of the water cycle in all its uh, glory and details, and uh, we're trying to boil it down into elements and uh, each element consisting of zones and nodes. So again, trying to take that, that physical process and represent them through physical equations that we know, uh, you know, and, and sometimes empirical uh, uh, relationship as well, uh, and do our best to reasonably represent each aspect of the hydrological cycle. By now you must be wondering that you thought that you would be uh, knowing about the impacts of climate models on hydrology, but you know, we need to go through this step first uh, before we can apply those climate models to be able to predict the changes in hydrology. So we'll spend a little bit of time on uh, the HSPF model itself for the Edwards Aquifer, specifically the dry Frio and the Frio and how we calibrated and validated it, and how we then used it to uh, look at the impacts of uh, a changing climate. So HSPF models, you know, it's, it's a representation of uh, uh, various elements lumped together. An element consists of zones and nodes. So uh, a zone is basically a piece of the physical land. So, uh, it's, it's the smallest segment that represents uh, physical hydrology that's occurring on your piece of land. So it could be a pervious land segment or an impervious land segment or a reach. So uh, to uh, you know, boil it down to a more simplistic level, it basically consists of pervious and impervious land segments that are connected to reaches at, uh, you know, at a user-defined spatial resolution. Your spatial resolution would be your sub -basis. So talking a little bit about the HSPF models that the Edwards Aquifer Authority has. So there are uh, roughly nine HSPF models uh, that the Edwards Aquifer Authority has uh, and uses it to assess long-term recharge. 
uh, that he had for Sophomore, starting in 1950. These models were first developed, uh, what, back in 2005 by, uh, I guess, LBG Guiding Associates and uh, Aquaterra. Uh, uh, and at that time, the purpose was to look at historical recharge from 1950 to 2000. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's one tool in the arsenal of tools that Edwards Aquifer Authority uses to uh, see uh, how that recharge varies over time. Again, in 2013 and 2017, uh, these models were further updated by uh, Clear, Creek, Clear Creek Solutions uh, to uh, update land use, uh, uh, increase the spatial specificity of the uh, weather data, specifically incorporate radar based precipitation, and then recalibrate those models to uh, USGS gauges. So, me and my ex-colleagues, we started working with Edwards Aquifer Authority back in 2019, uh, 2020 time frame. Uh, we started with reviewing uh, some of the models, specifically the Blanco model, uh, right there, and the Frio and the Dry Frio models uh, to see if they could be improved. You know, one of the things that we were looking at was, uh, are there ways to uh, make these models more efficient? Uh, at the time when these models were developed, um, generally for a watershed, you'll have one file that represents the entire model. But um, to have a better accounting for uh, the different components of the hydrologic cycle within these watersheds, uh, these models often for one watershed, there were like 11 models. So one model will talk to one, uh, another, and, and so on and so forth in series. So to get results for a single run, you have to run them in series and then feed the results from one into the other. So one of the things we looked at was uh, without sacrificing the details, could we combine all of that into one model? So that's exactly what we did with the Frio uh, and the Dry Frio Basin. Uh, there were 11 uh, user controlled input files, which are the, uh, the HSPF models per se. Uh, we combined them into uh, a single model. Uh, what that does is it simplifies uh, the process of trying to run uh, multiple climate simulations, right? So if you have 40 climate models, uh, so in one model you're running it 40 times, but if you have 40 climate models and 11 models, you're running it 40 times 11. So, uh, so it was, you know, uh, thinking down the road to make it uh, uh, a little more uh, easier uh, on us. Uh, when we did the simulations and looked at the uh, assessment of the uh, future climate uh, on the hydrology and also the recharge uh, uh, in these uh, watersheds. So, uh, like I was uh, mentioning earlier, the, the components of, a, uh, of an HSPF model, uh, you know, um, like most watershed models, it's, combined, it's uh, comprised of sub-basins and reaches. And each subbasin is further broken down into land segments, uh, which are uh, unique uh, in their hydrological responses. So, from the standpoint of this model uh, and the other HSPF models that were constructed for Edwards Aquifer Authority, um, each of these previous land segments are basically unique combinations of uh, topographic characteristics. You know, generally speaking, slope. Um, soil properties and geology uh, and land use uh, and um, when these models were updated in the 2013 and 2017 uh, time frames um, since radar data was used uh, HSPF still cannot use grid, gridded uh, uh, data readily so we have to boil it down to uh, one weather station basically per subbasin so uh, that's also factored into those uh, previous land segments within the uh, model. In addition to that, uh, for uh, the Edwards Aquifer Authority, another factor is uh, the contributing zone uh, versus the uh, uh, you know the recharge zone. So that's shown in uh, that uh, uh, light orange color, and the green is the basically the contributing zone. So um, the recharge that happens uh, in the contributing zone only diffuse recharge that doesn't uh, generally make it to the Edwards Aquifer formation. All of the recharge that happens in the um, uh, recharge zone is basically what we are interested in. 
So other considerations when you're doing a hydrological model are you know, basically simulation time period and time step. So these were HSPF models. We were running them uh, at an hourly time step, and we were running them for at least uh, 20 years at a time so that we had a good representation of the time. So uh, for, the, for a model to be able to predict um, future conditions, uh, we would like uh, for it to be, uh, you know, we, we first calibrate the model to historic data so that we know that it's performing well and it has the predictive capability uh, to be able to ingest, you know, uh, data it hasn't seen and then predict based on that. So when it comes to calibrating a watershed model, uh, you kind of take a, um, uh, a multiple objective approach. Um, you know, some of the things that you would like to look at are, you know, how does the uh, overall water balance look like over a 10, 15 year period? Does it make sense? I mean, is it all runoff? Or, you know, does your evapotranspiration make sense? And does your uh, runoff make sense? And does your interflow make sense? So in our case, uh, for this watershed, you know, our decision variables were, um, uh, what does the recharge look like? Does it compare well with other sources of recharge data? Specifically for this case, it would be the monthly recharge estimates that are produced by USGS based on stream flow data and estimated runoff. Um, how does the stream flow look? Uh, you know, there are three USGS gauges in case that I not mentioned. Um, there are three USGS gauges in the Rio Basin. How does the stream flow uh, produced by the HSPF model match up with the USGS reported stream flows? And in addition to that, um, you know, with the advent of technology, there are um, various um, derived data sets that we can use these days to basically corroborate the response of our model. So one of those data sets is the uh, uh, actual evapotranspiration data that are often derived uh, using satellite uh, data. So we use uh, MODIS and also some of the outputs from the uh, land surface models to basically constrain the different responses of the hydrologic cycle uh, of this particular watershed. So looking at evapotranspiration, again, uh, we use multiple um, data sources to see if our average monthly trends uh, match up with the data that's out there. So uh, if you uh, focus on the graph that's on the lower right corner, uh, the, the orange line uh, with the dots are the average monthly evapotranspiration that are predicted by the HSPF model. The red is the uh, uh, NOAA land surface model uh, responses. And then the blue is the uh, MODIS MOD16 um, actual evapotranspiration. So um, what we see is it's kind of in between those two data sets. And so we kind of looked at a, a paper by um, Long that kind of did a similar assessment of um, you know, the outputs of evapotranspiration from the various land surface models and how does it compare with, with MODIS. So for Middle Texas, you can see right there, uh, the land surface models consistently are overpredicted, are, are higher than, than the MODIS data set. And uh, where the dry Frio and the Frio uh, estimates are there, right in the middle. So reasonable? Probably. Uh, another line of evidence is, you know, uh, for this watershed and all the watersheds in the uh, Edwards Aquifer uh, region, uh, we have uh, estimates of monthly recharge uh, from USGS. Again, you know, the monthly recharge are empirically derived using observed stream flow data and estimates of runoff. So they are uncertain, right? But, uh, you know, what we are trying to do is not necessarily match, you know, these huge peaks that we see. We understand that these are uncertain, but we are, what we are trying to match is the trend. Like, are we matching the trend uh, close enough? So. Uh, that was basically uh, uh, our goal. You know, you're trying to match so many things and you won't get a perfect match between everything. So uh, is it reasonable enough? Our third and final uh, uh, line of evidence is basically trying to match uh, 
stream flow uh, against observed USGS data. So our calibration was for the most recent 10 year period. At that time it was from 2008 to 2018. Um, again, uh, we are just not looking to calibrate to a, a specific portion of the hydrograph, but the hydrograph as a whole. You know, how do the peak flows look? How do the low flows look? Are there seasonal biases, et cetera, et cetera. So again, you know, the goal is to have a rep reasonable representation of the hydrologic cycle and uh, without over calibrating the model uh, and also, you know, removing any consistent biases. So, and also you're trying to constrain the model uh, not only at one location, but at different spatial locations. So uh, it's uh, equal part science and equal parts part, I guess. So uh, again, this shows a, a reasonable match over the 10 year period. Of course, we won't be matching every peak, but the trends are there. Uh, there is a slight underestimation of the high flows. Uh, the, that one was at the dry frio uh, USGS gauge. Uh, the results are, uh, you know, similar at the uh, uh, Frio River at Konkan. Uh, and lastly, uh, the one that is downstream, which is uh, just below the recharge zone. So you can see in the observed data uh, how much of a recharge happens uh, between uh, you know, those two upstream gauges and the downstream gauge, which is, you know, just below the recharge zone. So we see consistent flows in the observed hydrograph at both of these upstream locations. But the, by the time we get to the downstream location, a lot of that flow has been, you know, gone to recharge. And that speaks to Hakan's point that a lot of the recharge in these basins is, um, what was the focus, focus. focus recharge. So. so at this point, you know, looking at different things, uh, we, we believe that the model was doing a reasonable job uh, at uh, simulating historic conditions, so we have a calibrated model. Now we are at a point where we can use these models to try and predict uh, uh, what uh, the flows uh, or the different aspects of the hydrological cycle would be based on different forcings. So in our case, the forcings would be the precipitation and also evapotranspiration. So at that time, this was back in 2019-2020 time frame, CMEP 6 was still not out, uh, CMEP 5 was popular, uh, and a lot of downscale products have been had been produced by different entities. The two most popular CMF5 products, MACA and LOCA, uh, we, we looked at both of these products uh, and also the Cordex um, uh, data sets. The issue with Cordex is um, it's a little difficult. You can go down many rabbit holes with Cordex. Uh, and there isn't a lot of good documentation on what to use, why to use, et cetera, et cetera. MACA and LOCA have good documentation, you know, how these data sets were produced, and they come in a very Python or programmable format. So they are all in that CDF format. So you can write codes to readily download them and clip them to your study area and area with them and slice them and dice them as you like it. We specifically chose MACA because MACA at that time um, was one of the few downscale products that had all the climate variables that are necessary to produce potential evapotranspiration time series. So like uh, these models, the two forcings that are within the model are uh, hourly precipitation and hourly uh, PET. So, we therefore uh, chose, chose MACA because we were using a pen and pen method, which is one of the few energy balance methods that uh, you use to produce your potential evapotranspiration time series. Although I believe, uh, Hakan, you've done some research and seen that temperature is potentially the most important factor when it comes to uh, evapotranspiration in this region. Solar radiation and temperature. Yeah, so, so that's the uh, disadvantage with LOCA. LOCA gives you precipitation and temperature, doesn't give you 
the uh, short wave radiation that is needed uh, to produce your potential evapotranspiration principles. So, with that, MACA provides 20 downscale GCMs. Um, if you are resource trapped, how do you, you know, use all those 20 GCMs? Um, you know, it's it's difficult, right? Like, especially if you're trying to do this manually uh, across the two RCPs or four RCPs, uh, it takes a lot of time and energy. So there are tools out there that you can use to basically screen these uh, climate model outputs and see which ones uh, would be most beneficial to use. So um, EPA has this tool called the uh, LASSO tool. Uh, I forget the name uh, uh, of the uh, scripter. It will come to me uh, later, I'm sure. But it, it's a, it's a Python-based tool that you can use to uh, download data for your specific region and then look at metrics uh, uh, such as, you know, how does, you know, compared to a baseline period, uh, say from 1950 to 2005, and a future period, how does your precipitation and temperature change relative to each other? So in this case, if we just focus on this graphic on the left, these are, this, this lasso per se, are your uh, ensemble of potential outcomes, right? So like 37.1 there, it is, a, um, it is a wet scenario along with, uh, you know, a very low increase in temperature. The 28-1, you're seeing a reduction in precipitation and also your temperature is increasing. So that is potentially a dry scenario. So if strapped for time, cash, resources, etc., uh, you know, you could potentially choose to do a median scenario, uh, a wet scenario, and a dry scenario, or you could try the ones, uh, you know, at the, uh, at the nodes of the last, last of basically. So one on the left is for RCP45, and the one on the right is for RCP85. Thankfully, Paul paid us enough to, to triage the whole thing. <laughs> so, um, so MACA provides about 20 uh, GCMs. Uh, some of them did not have uh, a few variables that were needed to generate the PET time series, I believe. So those were excluded from the ultimate assessment. So of the 20, I believe we did uh, 18. I've highlighted the ones in red. Uh, these are two of the five GCMs that Dr. Wooten is using uh, for regional downscaling uh, for the Edwards Aquifer region. So. Um, again, before I proceed further, I would like to say that, you know, all of this probably wouldn't have been possible if um, coding platforms like Python was not available to us. So the beauty of HSPF is it's an open source tool. You can pretty much uh, call the EXE and run the model, take the outputs out and do your assessment, and you could all wrap that up within a Python script. So. We were able to develop Python scripts that would download your MACA data, you know, clip them up for the, the dry Frio, uh, Frio basins, create the forcing files, run the HSPF models, take the output, dump it into Excel so that we could do our assessment. So without having to do that 40 times by hand. So, so a, a moment of thanks to Python. <laughs> um, uh, I have my cheat sheet here. So, um, you know, I wanted to go over uh, some of the time series results that we got out of the uh, HSPF models. You know, what we are interested in looking at are, are trends, you know, and sometimes how, when you look at just the time series, and then when you try to average them out, you see slightly different results. So. In this case, this is the wet scenario, right? RCP45, 
um, which is the MRI CDCM3, uh, we see that under historic uh, or, or high cast conditions, there is an uptick in recharge, and the same thing is true uh, during the uh, forecast period, which is basically 2006 to uh, uh, 2099. So I have my cheat sheet here. Uh, over the forecast period, uh, that's an increase of 14% in recharge. Again, that's only one scenario. So when you look at the dry one, we see a, a slight downward trend in, in recharge in the forecast period. That boils down to about 29% reduction in recharge, so that's significant. When we look at the median scenario, again, we see you know, a downward trend, both for the hindcast period and the forecast period. So the median scenario predicts about 14% uh, reduction in recharge over that uh, 2006 to 2099 period. Now, bear in mind that as we get closer to that 2100 time period, um, the, especially for RCP85, the temperatures just shoot off, right? So those um, reductions in recharge could be even more drastic if we look at end of century results. Similarly for RCP85, um, we see reductions throughout the spectrum. Even for the wet scenario, we see about a 6% reduction in recharge. For the dry scenario, that's a 45% reduction. And for the median scenario, that's about a 26% uh, reduction. So now let's go and, and sum it up in terms of how do these trends look uh, from a standpoint of monthly patterns. So these are just means and medians across the uh, 40 odd um, you know, GC downscale GCMs. So what we are seeing is during the wet season, there's a definite uptake in, in recharge. So that could be because you know we're getting more flashy flows and that is promoting recharge during those periods. But perhaps during the rest of the time frame, um, our low flows are potentially decreasing. So what that translates to is a reduction uh, in recharge. An interesting story that this graph says is that although some of the reductions may be offset by increases in those flashy flows during the summer months, it may not be enough to you know, uh, keep the recharge uh, to historic levels. We see about a 4% uh, reduction in, in average, that's an ensemble mean. So Paul and I discussed and started to look at things in different ways, uh, like you know, what are other things that we could potentially look at. So one of the most severe drought periods uh, for Edwards Aquifer was the 1950s period, like Akan mentioned. So we couldn't simply look at a 10-year recharge from any of these future climate models and said, you know, do these fall below 500,000 acre feet? Because, you know, we are looking at simulated weather. So instead what we say that, you know, if you believe in the trends of the climate models, we can say that, say even in the, say, the 1950s, if a climate model predicts a certain recharge for that decade, uh, if we were assuming that, okay, from a trend standpoint, uh, we wanted to see how many times on a 10-year rolling basis do we fall below that 1950s time period for each climate model. So this kind of shows some, some drastic results, right? So as you kind of see the distribution, some of these models are predicting that you know, you can have, what, about 90 of those rolling periods. 80 times out of 90, uh, it's falling below that 1950s uh, recharge. Again, you know, it's a trend. It's not a definite thing saying that, okay, it will always fall below 90, but the median and the means are about 40 times. So 50% of the times in the future, there's a potential that your negative recharge could, could fall below 
uh, your 1950s historic drought periods. So those are the extreme drought conditions that uh, we were talking about and could potentially be something uh, that we are looking at just from a trend assessment standpoint and use of these uh, mechanistic uh, models. Again, the elephant in the room and the uncertainty is, you know, do you trust uh, these um, downscale climate models that have been downscale for the entire CONUS and they may not capture the specific trends of this region. So it will be interesting to see what these results look like using uh, you know, the downscale uh, products that Dr. Wooten has produced. So I mentioned that we used MACA. Uh, Army Corps has this tool called the Climate Hydrology Assessment Toolbox. What the Army Corps has done is basically taken local data and run them through uh, the variable infiltration capacity of the big model and ran it for the entire continental US. So you can potentially go into each of the hub four watersheds and then drill down to the streams and then see if there are certain trends that uh, are prevalent uh, you know, in these streams. So when I look at the Frio Basin, uh, based on the LOCA data set, I see there is a um, significant uptick in mean monthly stream flow. But you know this is just it's just one picture. It doesn't tell you, you know, what are the other parts of the hydrological cycle looking like and what would the recharge look like. But again, I just wanted to mention that you know there are other tools out there that can be used to uh, you know inform some trends uh, for this region and other regions as well. So I think that's all that I have. So. Thank, you. Oh, thank you very much, Sam. That was very interesting. Um, are there any questions? Okay. Thank you, Sam, for the great presentation. The question is, uh, Will you be able to estimate the ratio of the focus recharge versus diffuse recharge on the future climate conditions for the regions? Whether 80-20% ratio, roughly, gonna stay the same in the future? Because in the future, the global climate model says that there will be more extreme conditions, more, uh, you know, just like storm, and uh, just like a bigger storm in a, a shorter period. Would that impact, or the model can provide any insight into the ratio of the diffuse versus a focus recharge for the future? Yes. Uh, when we calibrated the model to the historic conditions, we had a diffuse versus focus ratio of 29% uh, to 71%-ish. So I wouldn't be surprised if that ratio shifts in the future because from a terrestrial standpoint, if you are seeing extended drought conditions, your soil is drying out, so the diffuse recharge will probably go down quite a bit. Um, so I would expect that fraction to shift quite a bit in the favor of focus recharge, but from a total standpoint, I guess you know that will also go down. So it's like a two-sided punch, I think, yeah. maybe. So, uh, and that has ramifications from the standpoint, I guess, you know, in terms of say, protecting reach or protecting your diffuse recharge or planning for green infrastructure to retain water and things like that. So, you know, it, it will be interesting to see, like, you know, if, if through use of certain management measures, could you still protect that, that diffuse recharge or let it not slide down so bad that you're completely losing out on that. So, that's what you Any other questions? Gordon? Thank you, Sam. That was very interesting. I have a question, and I think this is just a speculative question. Uh, will it be done or can it be done? And that is the feedback between uh, the change in climate and the type of permeable zones, the land cover characteristics and things like that. Is that, uh, is that something that's beginning to be approachable at this point? 
Yes, I, I believe the U.S. Forest Service has done some work uh, on that front, right? Like how, because of a changing in, change in climate, how that is going to influence your flora and fauna, right? So that kind of relates to how your land use would change. Uh, in addition to that, with um, I guess with CMIP 6 uh, and with the mix of the socioeconomic pathways, the SSP 2s and um, you know, the others, uh, you kind of have a feel for migration patterns as well, right? And how that will dictate perhaps imperviousness, which is potentially a big part of the hydrological cycle as well. So, uh, it, you know, this is from, from memory. In Minnesota, we looked at things like that, like, you know, how change in climate changes the entire uh, kinds of trees that you would expect in the future and therefore the impacts on hydrology. So, but then, you know, those are very regional level studies. I don't know if things like that are available for this region or not. And it would be probably worthwhile to take a look at that and see how that influences the future hydrology. So, if anything, the uncertainty is going from here to this, but, you know, how do we manage that? Huh? I'm sorry. Just trying to help. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. I just wanted to bring bring up one other elephant in the room, and that is, under your most rosy forecast, you expect potentially a 14% increase in recharge. But if you do a quick Google search, I think the amount of people moving into Texas is way more than 14% by 2021, and they're not bringing their water with us. So how can we use these models to make better water management decisions so that we don't run our groundwater bank account dry? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good point, especially for, uh, for systems that don't have limitations on the amount of pumping that's available. And uh, fortunately, the Edwards has a pretty strict capped uh, regulatory structure for the amount of pumping that's allowed. Um, and so somehow there's gonna have to be some management. But I think, you know, the stress on the Hill Country Aquifer is, uh, um, the Trinity Aquifer in the Hill Country has been pretty obvious. And uh, some of the information that Akan showed about the low flows at San Marcos Springs uh, relative to their flows in the past, I think that's a direct reflection of the stress on the Trinity Aquifer in that region. And, that, and uh, ideally, uh, this kind of information can be used to carry that forward. I think you know, one of the things is, um, one of the, the last slide that Sam showed kind of goes back to the uncertainty component that I mentioned very early on, and that is depending on the model selection and the predictive tool that's used, and you can get upward trends in flow in the Frio Basin or lower trends in flow in the Frio Basin. And uh, the uncertainties are so high right now, I think that's one of the reasons we've taken the efforts to try to get a more region-specific set of data that we can use to try to um, understand that. The other thing I would add is to kind of toot the EAA horn a little bit is for these diffuse recharge mechanisms, the amount of diffuse recharge that's available, is one of our primary efforts in terms of our research and understanding. We're working with BEG on some uh, you know, field-based experiments to try to quantify that. We have a field research part that's helping us understand how some of these land management tools might actually enhance not only soil carbon, but uh, enhance infiltration and water quality of the site. And so we're, we're looking at that as well. Unfortunately, they're, those are years long studies, and so we're still a few years away from really being able to quantify that uh, in, in a sense. Well, very good. Thank you very much, Dan. That was a good question.